questions and I'm going to just say what they are now so you can think about them um, but we will put them up uh, towards the end anyway. So where are the opportunities for powerful literacies today? What resources and allies can help further them? What might get in the way and how can these be or these obstacles be managed or reduced? So those are the questions we would like to ask you. Um, we will put those up at the end, but just in case you kind of wanted to have we think about them. Um, okay. Well, first, first of all, an apology because um, I decided I kind of get a bit ahead of myself, and I got a new smartphone, and so I decided to write my notes on the smartphone and my PowerPoint on the smartphone. But I'm not as smart as a phone, unfortunately, so I lost my PowerPoint. It's somewhere, I don't know. Uh, also, I, I was able to print out these, otherwise, you know, this could be uh, quite rambling. Um, anyway, so, so, so I don't have to go over there, I don't have to kind of flick, but you have to, um, you know, sort of stay with the fact that there would have been some power slide, pop up slide. That you got uh, okay, uh, just to say, in terms of literacy, what I'm thinking about is always text is somewhere involved in literacy. Um, now, obviously, kind of in, the day, in the age of social media, it's kind of linked with visual, with iconic information, um, but always some kind of degree of text sort of is connected in there. Now, that might, people might say, well, there's oral literacy, and okay, I kind of sort of tend to accept this. My working definition, in a sense, is excluding that to some degree. But I think there's something that has to hold the idea of literacy or literacies together, and that has some to do with text. Okay. And I wanted to start, this is my first slide, was Ideologies of Literacy Practice from Mary Hamilton. And it's, it's in a chapter in a book uh, that uh, Sarah has over there. And she talks about four distinct ideologies of, uh, of literacy. Literacy for social control is kind of way of shaping functionally and morally uh, responsible people who will be economically productive citizens. Now, we've all heard of that one. Uh, I should. Literacy as a cultural missionary activity. Now, that ideology has sort of like some strong roots, probably in a kind of religiously influenced kind of work around reading the Bible and so on, historically. Uh, but my own experience of working in the 1980s in uh, basic, what's called basic education at that point was also kind of like uh, transformed into a cultural missionary activity of bringing uh, enlightenment access to poor people who hadn't acquired literacy skills. It was kind of, a, it wasn't stated so openly like that, but you can get the sense sense of that. Literacy is a remedial activity for poor people who didn't quite have the capacity to acquire it at school. So it was kind of part of that. People with learning difficulties that, um, that needed some remedial help. And then finally, she says, literacy as an emancipatory activity, obviously linked with kind of critiques of dominant culture, ways in which schooling or limited forms of schooling was available to people, limited, limited types of knowledge, uh, and implied a radical critique of uh, existing things as they existed and what needed to be done to change things. So part of literacy was always kind of linked to some sense of action to change things. So um, two points to take from these kind of four distinctions. One the purpose and practice of literacy is contested. We often just kind of assume somehow or other that it's straightforward, that it's just one type of thing. But clearly there are different things going on all the time in what we think about uh, literacy. And that the radical tradition, which is what we focus on, was always part of a kind of independent working class education. 
independent from the state, from religious influence and so on. And it was to serve the interests of working class communities and other marginalised or exploited groups. So literacy was you know, woven into the fabric <coughs> of organisations where I found to sort of resist at a community level. And, you know, we talk about our education histories, um, and when um, Sharon was kind of referring to the news about, you know, adult education in change, about the process of social change, not about adult education history, adult education in history, making history, part of that kind of uh, fundamental change. <coughs> now, I can really just kind of sketch a few things, leaving out tons of stuff, which is obviously uh, unnecessary, but if we take the long view, we go back way beyond 100 years, obviously, of radical uh, education. For example, in 1822, there were 51 Scottish working class, working class controlled libraries without any middle class influence. The, now, I don't know if I'm getting the, this pronunciation correct, the one lock um, head. The one lock head? It's in Dumfries Galloway. It's in Dumfries Galloway. Uh, one of the first it was founded in 1756. Part of that kind of tradition of working class communities. So lots of kind of five and so on. They would produce their own kind of libraries because they needed to use knowledge for to further their own particular interests. So these institutions were the tip of an iceberg of a growing kind of radical political, social culture that wanted to sort of like educate themselves into looking at examining the inequalities and so on that existed and what, could, what they could do about them. But they were not explicitly political in any sort of simple sense. Um, they provided a wide range of literature for a wide range of interests that people would uh, become sort of involved in. But what was learned from and that was much in the tradition of kind of the idea of mutual improvement <coughs> rather than sort of like a radical, sorry, some radical end. But for instance, many of the Chartist papers, now moving forward from the 70s into the 1830s, 1840s, many of the Chartist papers actually suppressed the political content to include a much wider range uh, of material within them. Um, as one such convert to Chartism remarked, the poetry of Coleridge and Shelley was stirring within me and making me a chartist and something much more. Now, I was in the Jonathan Rose, the British, uh, the intellectual history of the British working class, fantastic kind of uh, book. And the democracy movement of the 1830s, 40s, and so on provided a rich, sort of like a range of material, informal situations, the kind of things that um, Sharon was talking about. And provide their own institutions and ideas um, which would help shape the values and the actions that they needed to take. The struggle for the vote throughout the 19th century came, came and went, uh, but it was also always part of that kind of wider struggle for dignity and human equality. And that kind of always, always occurred within it. The Committee for Public Libraries in 1849. Noted that it led to, direct quote, exercising the minds of the labouring classes better than any school instruction. And that's uh, in a book by uh, Dobbs, I, 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 I think it's Alex Nesson, Dobbs, written in 1919, uh, no, no, 1918, on education and social movements. <coughs> Fantastic uh, collection that he has got in that book. That committee on public libraries libraries call this process of participation education by collision. <laughs> education by collision. And there were lots of collisions taking place. Traditional kind of authorities running up against science, reason, those kind of collisions. Collisions between the need for the growing kind of discipline of factory life and the earlier popular cultural uh, ways of uh, living. The collision between widespread poverty and opulence, that people were beginning to question why did they live in such a rich society and uh, be so poor. And so we have a kind of literacy is linked to the kind of growth of a thriving culture, um, challenging, opinionated, questioning. Um, and that book by uh, 
Edward Thompson, the maker of the English working class, uh, a fantastic kind <coughs> of uh, resourceman. And John Stuart Mill, the key liberal philosopher of that period, um, commented that the position which gives the strongest stimulus to the growth of intelligence is that of rising to power, not that of having achieved it. So there you go, Boris Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, like, there's a huge range of examples of social and political movements and institutions that, you know, just were provided a kaleidoscope of kind of demands for independent working class education. And as the 1990 report recognised, and here's a quote the growth of movements which have their aim, the creation of a better social order, is not less important than the process of education itself. Such movements create the background of aspiration and endeavour, which is the foundation of more directly educational work. What I wish to highlight, kind of relevant to my theme, is that this involved in free hour terms the practice of reading the word and reading the world. They are mutually constitutive, uh, creating the kind of possibilities for literacy to be in history. Uh, to be an essential part of those struggles for emancipation. I'm not going to show the uh, Fast forward very quickly then. Um, the modern history of radical literacy, at least outside of Scotland, is associated with clearly Paolo Freire's pedagogy of the oppressed, a way of working teaching with the oppressed. Um, this philosophy that uh, education was never neutral, had to be uh, grounded in the generative themes of, uh, from people's lives. Uh, that the appropriate methodology for liber liberating was dialogical, uh, and that people had teacher and student were interchangeable in their roles, all that kind of bringing together of an ontological equality into the educational experience. So, I mean, it's been a dramatic kind of powerful influence in terms of the practice of uh, radical literacies, but I would say not so much in Scotland, actually. Um, more generally in the field of adult education, but probably less kind of specific to the practice of literacy in Scotland. But, kind of getting to, to where we are now, he's, uh, this idea is connect, can be connected very clearly with the idea of literacy as a social practice. Now that kind of notion underpinned the Adult Literacy and Numeracy in Scotland report in 2001, and is still seen as a core element of kind of uh, literacy is practice. The idea that it's social, that people, it's a reciprocal process of people <coughs> in relationships using text um, as a part of other, and other, with other things as well, but using uh, kind of literacies because it relates to their context, their issues, their interests, and the idea that that you build, build on people's wealth, the knowledge, the experience they bring to the situation, uh, and that sort of social kind of the sense of a social dimension to the to the practice of literacy is really kind of key, and that has been exploited by um, workers to be able to do a whole range <coughs> of different types of literacy practices, and not simply started from the idea of some or other, you know, it's like more of a remedial model. There's a kind of uh, literacy student um, at, the, at the bottom ring of the ladder, you know, and they slowly will work their way up and kind of put their dipstick and measure where they are and so on. Um, so it kind of challenges that notion. Of course, kind of literacy practitioners have, have to be artful, they have to be uh, thoughtful, they have to listen <coughs> to the struggles of different uh, communities. In uh, one of the anthologies that we produced with Mary Hamilton and Lynn Tech, um, John, I've got to mention John's, uh, John Player's work really, <coughs> on football literacies, using the common interest as social practice, what brings people together to examine the world, globalisation, racism, in, you know, uh, economic inequalities, homophobia, sexism, uh, all these things providing the, a reading of the world that was used to also write the word, to construct, to deconstruct texts and to reconstruct them 
um, so to develop the kind of uh, richness in their literacy practices. So I would really kind of recommend uh, John's chapter in there. Alan Addison, um, who uh, was involved in Scott's family literacy practices, using the language of people in poor, um, poor communities in the uh, north part of Edinburgh, using their everyday language as part of a resource for writing <coughs> plays, for educating children, and for educating adults. Uh, and that kind of powerful recognition that the, uh, the adults who were involved in these activities, that this was okay, it was acceptable. This wasn't just kind of inadequate English, this was a, a natural language of the whole, the family, the community, and therefore it was a resource. Um, so in conclusion, radical and empowering, empowering literacies need to connect or reconnect the word and the world. That is what makes them powerful. Uh, literacy is not a technical, neutral activity divorced from context. Always part of that uh, social practice. And as a, a history of radical education, it's always part of that shared struggles of people trying to, uh, to make uh, some difference to their world. So the lesson of history, as long as the world is a problem, there is always going to be struggles for democracy and dignity and human equality. There will always be context for empowering literacies until we crack those problems. <laughs> uh, science of practice may change. Policy context may alter that. But those enduring issues are there and they will not go away and therefore they are sites for uh, radical empowering literacy. Um, and so, you know, our question is, uh, you know, where are the opportunities today? Where are the problems? How do we engage with those? And we must, you know, we cannot sit back. As kind of Freire would have said, you know, you sit back from that, you side with the power. You haven't got a choice. Thank you very much.